uh, on a battlefield, your commanding officer is not going to be a happy bunny if you've got to put diesel in a petrol tank or petrol in a diesel tank. So that risk goes out the window. It helps with the logistic supply. So only diesel engines now in British Army service. And the 432, it's also got things on it. Uh, those stubby little tubes at the front, you'll see those on a lot of armoured vehicles. Sometimes they're put on the turret, sometimes on the front wings of vehicles. Those tubes, they're what's called smoke dischargers. And the idea inside each of those little holes, about the size of a Coke can, is a smoke grenade. And if the vehicle's attacked, the driver can press the button. Out goes a pack of smoke grenades in front of the vehicle. Nice big smoke screen. You can hide yourself and reposition yourself or get out of trouble. Um, and you'll see those on a lot of armoured vehicles. Some vehicles make smoke screens now by pouring uh, diesel from the engine onto the hot exhaust. That makes a white, big, billowy cloud. So uh, different ways you can make a smoke screen. Now, next vehicle coming on. Again, you can see it's on a tank. This is what they call a load carrying or supply vehicle. Now, if you can imagine, your big heavy tanks may have gone at vast across the battlefield that's been chewed up by shell fire. Those tanks are going to need resupply. They need a lot of things to keep them going. There's the obvious things like ammunition and petrol and maybe food for the crew, um, but also tanks are notoriously unreliable and they quite often need spare parts, new engines, all sorts of things. Now, your traditional supply truck may not be able to drive across a chewed up battlefield to get to where the tanks have got to. And that's why you need a vehicle like this. This is really like a Ford Transit on truck, on track. So it can put supplies in the back, carry them forward across the battlefield, and get to where those supplies are needed. And uh, tanks, by the way, they need a huge amount of petrol to keep them going. One lap around this arena for one of our big heavy tanks is about a gallon of fuel. So you're going to need lots and lots of fuel. Now this particular vehicle, this, this was used, uh, it was originally made for the American Army, they called it the M5-4. American Sherman tank. Now those of you who have been inside the museum, you can see the tanks that Britain had at the beginning of the Second World War, and the honest truth was they were a fair match for the German tanks at the time, but we left most of our tanks behind us at Dunkirk, uh, we carried on making the tanks that we had on the production line rather than stop and make better or bigger tanks, even though we knew the Germans were coming with bigger ones, because we were desperate for anything. And uh, our own tank design fell behind the Germans for most of the rest of the war. Now we sent our engineers out to America. America wasn't in the war till December 41. We sent our engineers out there to help them design their new tank. And this is what they came up with, the Sherman tank. Now the British Army were the first to use the Sherman in combat. It was actually used at the Battle of Al Alamein. And uh, the British Army thought the Sherman was fantastic when it went into service. Why was it so good? Because it had got a reliable engine. And if you're a tank crewman, having a reliable engine means you can sleep at night. You don't have to work on it all the time to get it going to the guns now so they can fire accurately on the move. And that makes you a much harder target for the enemy to try and hit. Now this particular Sherman tank, it was actually used by the Canadian Army and uh, it was given to the tank museum some years ago and uh, we run it most summers here and it's a, a good indication of how good a reliable tank can be. Uh, we've only rebuilt the engine once, um, so it comes out pretty much every summer and that's another important thing to remember, you can have very jazzy, very specific... Where are they? Oh come on, you do better than that, where are they? Right, here they come then, here's the Ruritanians. Now what have they got? 
Now the Ruritanians get their tanks from all over the place. Um, they buy them from all around the world. Now the first one they've got there, the first tank, is something called a leopard tank. And it was the first tank the German army made after World War II. It was sold to lots of countries around the world. Very good tank. And you can hear that rumbly noise in the engine. Um, they designed it so it was very fast. They didn't put much armor on it. They thought if you were fast on the battlefield, that was a better protection than lots, lots of thick armor. Now the vehicle behind is not a tank at all. Now the second vehicle, that's what the, um, it looked like a tank but without the turret on the top and you'll see a number inside the museum. Um, they were, they're called the salt guns, or in the German parlance, the Sturmgeschutz. And they were invented originally in the Second World War. It's a cheap way of making a tank. You can build three of these for the cost of two turret tanks. And if you know where your enemy's coming from, you don't necessarily need a turret to spin round all the time. So you can hide a vehicle like this in a wood, or in a lane, or in a ditch. And it doesn't matter that it can't fire its gun all the way round in 360. It'll work just by pointing the gun at the enemy that way. And that particular one was made for the German army about the same time as the Leopard. It was called the Jagdkanone, and it was uh, designed for the Cold War, and we thought we were going to have to be knocking out lots and lots of Russian tanks. Now, it looks like the Ruritanians, they've captured the mound there. There we are, and they're putting their own flag up. Let's show them what we think about that. Mm. Right, remember that, they're the baddies, okay, and they've captured our mound. <laughs> what are you going to attack? What's the best way of attacking them? And if we look down the far end of the field, there's our reconnaissance vehicle sneaking its way forward, radioing that information back to the main force commander before they decide to take on these Ruritanians. And uh, he'll also be finding out things like, are the bridges heavy enough to drive over? Can he call in artillery fire on the Ruritanian position? Keep their heads down. Wake them up a bit. Keep them busy. And he can do all that just on his radios. He doesn't actually have to fight them himself. And of course, in reality, he'd never get this close. If something, if he gets this close to the enemy, something's gone badly wrong. He'd be about a mile away in the trees at the end of the field there, um, keeping out of sight, reporting back that way. But vitally important, he gets the information back to the main force commander so they know what they're attacking and where they're attacking. Now, we all know the British Army's a bit busy at the moment, so uh, they're going to probably be sending on our Sherman tank and our 432 to take on the Ruritanians. And uh, down the end there, there comes our Sherman, and following on is our 432 with the infantry in, because again, like we said earlier, it's still going to be the infantry that actually captures the ground and holds the ground on the battlefield. So the Sherman's moving round, the 432 with the infantry in, they could have been about driving around the battlefield for the last hour or so. So they always try and point the 432 to where they think the enemy is. So the guys jumping out the back, they know towards where they're attacking. Sherman's putting down suppressing fire on the Ruritanian position. And there's our, those of you can see the 432, they pointed it to where the enemy is. And uh, our volunteers are now jumping out the back ready to actually put that final attack in on the Ruritanian position. Now, we said earlier, these are our volunteers. What they're doing is they're putting in what they call a pepper pot attack. And the idea is, you send one section forward at a time, they run forward in a straight line, they then drop down, and then the other section comes forward and drops down as well. They try and keep in a straight line, not because the military just likes straight lines, it's very sensible, so you don't shoot your mate up the backside. 
Now in the media they call that friendly fire. It's the most unfriendly fire going, frankly, is if you're shot by your own side. And that's part of the training and the discipline they need to keep going forward and making sure they don't get in each other's way. Now I think a fitness training is going to be in order for one or two of the volunteers here, but they've now got the Ruritanians in their sights. He's getting them forward and charging the enemy. There they go, they're charging the Ruritanian position. And look at, oh, pathetic. Ruritanians are thrown in the towel already. Well done, our volunteers. Well done there.